This is the Beyond the Dojo podcast. I'm Lauren. I'm Jeremiah. Jeremiah was like, do you have something funny to say? I'm like, don't I always? Mm. So, uh, we had... (laughs) I think it's all funny, okay? Mm. I think I'm funny, so that's That's all that matters. Um, So, we have... You gotta believe in yourself. I do believe in myself so much. Uh, We have a young adult black belt who's on the spectrum, and we have... Some brown belts, adult black b- brown belts that he trains with, and this week one of the adult brown belts was recalling a an interaction between the two of them a few weeks back. The adult black belt usually gets to class right as we're starting class or right after. Um, so we were starting class one week, and I think I remember this. Uh, the brown belts were all lined up, and the black belt walks in and he goes at the front of the line. And he looks over at this brown belt that's telling me the story. He looks over at his belt and he's like, "Oh, still a brown belt, I see." That must suck. (laughs) And he goes, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess it does. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Mm. (laughs) So anyway. Yeah. um, It does actually suck to be a a brown belt, but maybe we'll talk about that a different time. Mm -hmm. But what we're going to talk about today is... um, Sucking. (laughs) Yeah. The the, the suck is what Jeremiah calls it. Um, No, what we're going to actually talk about is... um, What it's like to, or well, just kind of discuss the concept of when people leave karate and then they come back. And the reason this kind of popped into my head is we've had a couple of guys over the years, like when I managed the old dojo, and then even with this one that we have now, um, who they were a long time karateka, or maybe they were like brown belts, or they were, you know, like nidons or whatever, and they trained a number of years and for whatever reason they took some time off um like we have um someone that uh is kind of related to one of our black belts who came back briefly um or well who who i trained with when i was a kid and who came back to our dojo once like one day and um anyway that was just that was just what made me think about it was thinking about that scenario Mm. so anyway um so Jeremiah actually took some time off from karate. Yeah, it took for a like while. What, almost fifteen years, I think twelve years. What's so funny to me is that whenever whenever you tell parents or kids that you've been training since you were like eight and they go, Oh my god yeah, I, I always, go, guys I always leave out the, the I know, I always <laughs> I always think like guys, he took like fifteen years off. He's not a grandmaster yet, all right? Y'all just chill out. He'll be there soon. <laughs> You don't think you're a grandmaster? You think you're a grandmaster? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. I like. Well, maybe he is, and I just don't know it. I mean, so I am in my own mind. Yes. <laughs> so, what made you step away from karate? Okay, well, to begin with. I mean, I think the focus of karate was wasn't what it is today. Uh huh. So back in the day when I was younger, obviously competition was a big thing. Mm-hmm. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was able to compete. In Japan, and do well in Japan. I was able to compete, and when we moved back to the states, in the AAU, did well there. Um, just really enjoyed it, but I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform. Um, so I qualified for the nationals twice, two years in a row. Mm-hmm. How old were you at this point? Uh, I, was, uh, I qualified when I was fourteen and fifteen, mm-hmm. and um, my dad retired when mm-hmm. I was fifteen, and. Uh, um, He went down to Florida. He moved down to Florida, and he was getting everything ready. My mom and my sister and I stayed in New York because I qualified for the Nationals. I wanted to train and compete. So instead of moving down when my dad took his time off, we we stayed in New York, and my dad went down by himself to to get the the land right and, you know, get everything movable. uh, Move inable, I guess. Move inable. Yeah. So it it was just, it was really, it's... Um, put a lot of pressure on me. I wanted to perform well, you know. I felt like we, we, my dad sacrificed the time with his family and we sacrificed time, sacrificed time with my dad mm. so that I could chase a dream, right? Because right. at that time, I, I not only qualified for the national, I qualified for the JOs, so the Junior Olympics. And, um, you know, I, I put a lot of pressure those years, 13, 14, 15, um, almost to 16, and uh, just trained every day. Mm-hmm. Never was satisfied with anything I did. Um, did very well locally, regionally, you know, districts and regionals and all that. But when it came to the nationals, I choked both times. 
Mm. I absolutely choked. Um, stubbed my toe on the last step and punch at Konkushul. Mm -hmm. And to the point where I stumbled a little bit. And pff, all the judges came up to me afterwards like, dude, if you wouldn't have stumbled, you at least placed. And I was like, ah, Got you know. Those... Big old monkey toes. Well, you know, it's just one of those things. <laughs> um, and... Uh, by the age of when I got when we moved down here, um, first of all, the only dojo I, I could go to was at University of Florida, and what ended up happening was I was the highest ranked person there. Mm -hmm. So majority of the time they would you know I was kind of looked at me as to to run the class, you know, and like at sixteen years old I didn't want to do that. Yeah, and it kind of that kind of really put a damper on like my training and everything. But I trained till I was eighteen, not like. Not like I did before. It wasn't so, consistent. So you were, why Why were you asked to teach? Because well, I was the highest rank. And there wasn't anybody else well, that was qualified to if teach? if there was someone else there that was black belt, uh -huh. they taught. Okay. The problem is, they didn't always show up, and a black belt wouldn't always show up. So that, the way that you, university clubs work is, like, whoever is the highest rank, like, no, they're the one um, that teaches, or no, they no. designate somebody? At that, at that club, at the UF club. There was designated senseis and stuff like that, but they were going through a transition from the guy that was teaching that was not a student. Mm -hmm. um, he got a different job and was on the road a lot more, mm -hmm. and he just, it, I mean, he had to make money. Yeah. I can respect that. But the yeah. guys that, that were stepping up behind him, um, they, were, they were in the engineering college, or I'm sorry, they were in their, their colleges and, and professional like grade, and they just didn't have the time. Right. You know, it wasn't like anybody didn't want to do it. It was just the, the time limiting factor was the time. Mm -hmm. So they would ask, you know, if there was no one there, I would teach. I feel and, like this, just, just kind of make this point. I feel like this is kind of a similar situation that a lot of people end up facing before they step away. Is like, we talked, we had a burnout episode. Mm -hmm. We were talking about burnout. I feel like this is kind of one of those things it where is. like you've spent all this time training now all of a sudden you're responsible for teaching. It's a lot of pressure, especially yeah. if it's not your business or if it's oh. not like a club that you founded. Right. This is something that I saw many times with the guys that were in our club um, that they were basically having to cover the club and it wasn't really their club. Like they were having right. to teach everything. So just pointing this out, like this is this happens yeah, a so lot. It's not unique. Yeah. Um, and then the other added factor was, you know, I'm a 16 year old high school kid right. telling college kids what to do. Yeah. And, you know, some of those dudes, you know, it, some of those brown belts thought that they, that I wasn't worth my position, I guess. Okay. So, it, you know, it back in the day, that's just the way it was. Anyways, mm -hmm. it was egos and rah, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. I kind of got burned out on that. Mm -hmm. And I, I missed my social life. I missed all these things that, um, I thought were going to be so awesome. Mm -hmm. I think they call it a, like a, it's a, it's a syndrome. Like you, you, you're, it's the fear of missing FOMO. out. Huh? FOMO. Yeah. Where you, you're fear of missing out. Right. Mm -hmm. And that kind of drove, drove me hardcore from in my twenties. Mm, okay. And I, you know, just. So you stepped away at like 16. I and... stepped away at 18. Oh, I, okay. I still, still went and it's funny. I went to the club more when I wasn't a student at UF than I did when I was a student. When was that? Oh, before you were a student at UF. Yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So in those first two years, I was there pretty consistently. So it's crazy. So you were able to train there even though you weren't a UF student. Yeah. So here's the cool thing. That was... The way they where they trained um, mm -hmm. was the old ten, um, the old female teachers at teachers college, mm -hmm. and they had a, a female gym there that used to be the fe female only gym. Mm -hmm. um, but but it was just a wooden floor, no AC. They had mm -hmm. one little bathroom on the bottom floor. Right. Um, old old building, but mm -hmm. um. Class was after parking lot, like parking requirements. So I was able to park right in front of that gym. Okay. And never get towed. Okay. And no one ever checked us. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, come in and see who's there and all that. It, no one ever checked us. And if they did, they would look at me and go, oh, he looks kind of young, but okay. One time when I was in college, I got a parking ticket for parking facing out in a 45 degree parking spot in an empty parking lot. Mm. Just saying. Yeah. Well, it sucks to be you. Yeah, it did. I was pretty pissed. I mean, mad. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um. So that's that's my story. Mm -hmm. And basically, got tired of the whole thing and walked away. Um, you never fast. trained at all during that time that you were off. Not at the dojo. Mm. I I never went back to that dojo. Um, I, I the last day I was at that dojo, um, some dude came up and was was teaching class, and it was like the first time anybody seen him there, and he was demonstrating on something and. Used me as a kid and grabbed my gi 
and he pulled so hard that he ripped it. Like, he ripped my gi open. And he goes, eh, and just kind of shrugs it off at me, and I'm just like, mm-hmm. okay. And I just, you know, after that, I was like, yeah, I'm done with this place. I'm done with all this. Yeah. I'm done with that attitude. I'm done with everything. So I just walked away. And you didn't bother looking for another place to train? No, nah, not till I was 33. Okay. So a lot later down the road. Yeah, a lot later down the road. I mean, 15 years, literally. Yeah. Um, so, like, what I'm saying is, like, even that time off, you never had any home training or anything I like trained, that? I trained. So I never stopped doing karate. I just stopped doing karate, like, in the official sense. Like, mm-hmm. and go to a class and train like that. But I would, man, I was constantly, like, if I was home alone, I would just do kihon up and down the floor. Mm-hmm. I would go through the katas because I'd be afraid and forget, I forgot them. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't like I was improving my technique. It wasn't like, you know, I was even maintaining. It was just something. Kind of I would, remembering. Just trying to remember things mm-hmm. and not forget them. So it wasn't like a serious train. But right. I did stay in the mindset. So, and, sorry, go ahead. And I, I mean, at that time I did a lot of mowing. I was I, I was a professional landscaper. So I, I, I was in a very fortunate position to mow a lot mm-hmm. and sit on a mower all day long. There's nothing else to think about. Yeah. I would just constantly in my mind go through kata. You could have like used your mower <clears throat> no. and used that as like the shape and like made the kata shapes the footprint. No. And then just gone back over it and No. You didn't want to try that? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> so what made you go back to karate after fifteen years off? Hmm. Well, I was going through a divorce, mm-hmm. and I saw a lot of things in myself that I didn't like mm-hmm. in an effort to make myself... Mo better. Well, yeah, and mo better, just, you know, feel like myself again. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I'll just go back to karate. I could train. It's something I did. Mm-hmm. It's a major part of my life, and then when it wasn't a major part of my life, I went down dumb street. You know, mm-hmm. just kind of did some really stupid things along the line. And, you know, I, I, I was tired of it. I was tired of that lifestyle. I was tired of that whole, like, that, that emptiness feeling. So, I went back to karate. So, did you just, like, start Googling karate places to train or something? Yeah, or? I said uh, closest karate dojo. Mm. Then it was uh, closest Shotokan. Mm. And only one that was close to me was in Ocala. So, how many dojos did you go to before you ended up at the Shotokan place in Ocala? Did you just go straight I there? I went straight there. Oh, okay. I looked at the website and I was like, okay, it looks kind of like what we do, what I did. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, so you were able to track one down. Well, well, yeah, that and, and I was pretty impressed because on the website, it proclaimed the head instructor as a sixth time. And when I quit training, mm-hmm. it was still like, it was a major thing to be, to be fifth on and above. Right. So in my mind, I went, oh, wow, I found a gem. Yeah, and you were a need on whenever you quit. Oh, yeah, I quit when I was a need on. Yeah, yeah. So that when I did that, I saw that. I was like, oh, okay, I'll just quit training with them. Mm-hmm. I figured it'd be somewhat of the people, like, what I did. What rank was he? Huh? What rank was he? Was he a six ton? Um. A pretend six ton. <laughs> this is why you I, hate I higher level done ranks. I've never seen a certificate ranks. or I've never heard him mention, Self-proclaimed like, six ton. Um. I never met, he never, he was an organized, Black Belt Hall of Fame, six (laughs) done. He was, he, they weren't part of an organization. Mm. Um, and there was no outside influence. Mm. Um, and there was no kind of like verification of his Don ranking. Actually, what I, yeah. uh, (laughs) When I went there, I brought my D-Don certificate with me. Hmm. And was like, do I need to show you my knee down? Do I, do I need to show you my certificate? Said, oh, no, you're good. Mm. And I was like, okay, that's a little different. Yeah. And I was wondering if he, you know, wanted to, sh- I guess he was trying to step away from that or avoid that. Gotcha. In the long run, he wasn't a six time. All right. Baby break. Baby break. Okay. So now we're back. Mm. Uh, so once you got started... Back to training. Yeah. Um, what do you think were some of the biggest obstacles that you faced once we got past the... Thinking getting, I was still 18. Okay. You know, so by that I mean training like I was 18, just beating my body up, um, not properly warming up or stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next thing was uh, 
technique was poor. Okay. So my hips hurt, my back hurt, my elbows hurt. So do you think your technique when you before you quit was poor also? No, I think I think I had way better technique when I was eighteen. Mm-hmm. It was just you know years and years of a doing labors as work. Okay. Um, and just constantly muscling things through. I think it just bled over. I felt like I had good karate when I was eighteen. Gotcha. So of course it is hard to tell whenever you're a teenager and you're like very supple and yeah, whatever you don't yeah. get injured as easily. So yeah, <laughs> there, yeah. that's it. They know the great result. Exactly. Um, but then. Uh, the, so how long? So if you were, so you, you you like got started and did you notice right away like those first couple of training sessions like oh my gosh I feel like garbage or yeah oh yeah dude I the first couple of sessions I still thought I was eighteen so I trained as just as hard as that mm-hmm. uh, but then you know I had an hour ride from the dojo to my house mm-hmm. right and by the time I got to my house mm-hmm. I would feel like a ninety year old old man my back would just crink up and I, my muscles would tighten up and mm-hmm. I just I could barely stand up afterwards yeah and. It took me like, gosh, almost six six months to kind of like get feel normal. Was there any point in that six months that you were like, this isn't worth it? No, fortunately, no. Okay. Do you uh, see how other people would maybe think that though? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, the reason why I say that was, it was getting routine. It was getting mundane. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, but... One of the black belts there in Okina- Ocala, um, Jack Fullerton, mm-hmm. he wasn't a black belt at the time, he was a brown belt. Um, he's like, hey man, I'm going to the seminar with Steve Ubel up in Pensacola. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. He's like, man, it's going to be fun if you want to come. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, I have nothing else to do. How long had you been training at that point? Like uh, nine six months? Six months. Six, seven months. Okay. Um, and then that just blew me away. Yeah. Like, work, uh, training with Steve or training under Steve, it was like, yeah. We did hard training, like, that's hard training to me, like, three days, seminar, and honestly, my mind hurt more than my body. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Like, uh. it, that, that Ubla effect, you know, it hit me hard, mm. um, but it changed everything about how I looked at karate. Right. Instead of being this thing of manifestation of, like, power and ego, mm. it turned into, like, I want to be efficient, I want to have a long-lasting karate career, mm-hmm. I want this to be beneficial to me. Right. So it's interesting that you say that because we have had interaction with lots of people who've come into our dojo Mm -hmm. who have been either from other dojos and they never stopped training and they're just coming to train with us or they took some time off and they're coming in to train with us and it's a different experience training with us than maybe what they were used to previously. Um, And it's kind of one of those like, you either continue on down the same path and you just enjoy that and we're just kind of there to facilitate training or you kind of drink Kool-Aid and you're thinking about what you're doing a little yeah. bit differently. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you think if you hadn't hadn't gone to that seminar and you'd never had that crossing of paths with Steve, do you think you would have continued training? Until I had a major injury. Okay. Until I had a major injury and that would have probably been the, the icing on the cake. I'd have probably quit yeah. again. I think nail in the coffin would be a better. No, no icing on the cake. Depends you just on what pre- you, you just prefer the icing. I'm, dude, I'm kind of hungry still. So, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I just ate, but I'm like, man, I could, I could go for some. I could Oreos. go for some icing. So. <laughs> so okay, so so basically having that icing on the cake. Yeah, having the icing. But you think if you'd had a major injury, you probably just wouldn't have wouldn't have bothered. No. Gotcha. That no, makes sense. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have pushed myself. I, I would see no reason to. Mm-hmm. Um. Good things, blessings are, are there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and could you imagine that? Like how my life would be different? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Just, I, was, I was talking to somebody um, yesterday who said that they read this book about, I don't even know what it's called, but with a girl, I think she died or something. And she was introduced to this library of like all of these different books that showed what her life would have been if just one small thing had been different and there were all these different scenarios. Anyway, just made me think of that. I just mm. heard that yesterday. But um, anyway, it's interesting. And the reason I, w- I wanted us to talk about... Yeah, well, yeah. But about your background is because this is like this is like a, a cycle or this is a it's very a thing. typical thing yeah, that people thing. go through with leaving karate and then trying to come back. Yeah, well, for men, I think it's, it's a thing 
if you've done karate for a long time, you got to a certain level, yeah. and the expectation in your mind is that you're at that level, mm-hmm. and to come back and not be there, yeah, or come back and train as if you were, and then hurt yourself almost immediately, yeah, it's a thing. It's like people don't want to deal with that, you know. We've had guys who have been so generous to us, like older guys who've contacted our dojo and have donated like their entire book collection, yeah. which we're so grateful for. But we have almost begged these guys like please come and train with us like we promise like it's going to be different than what you used to do but that's okay like you can you can come and train with us and and just you know explore a new aspect of the shotokan that you used to love but a lot of people are just like Done. that door's closed and i'm not gonna yeah. go back there because i think i feel like these guys like in their mind um there's like an they have an image of what karate should look like and what they should look like doing it. I think maybe, maybe you said that earlier yeah. and, and, um, how they should feel doing it and how yeah. much effort they should exert. And if they can't be that level of athlete, they don't want to bother. Yeah. 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 Well, getting old is very humbling mm-hmm. and some guys Amen. just don't want to, they, instead of facing it, they just rather act like it doesn't happen mm. and don't do anything to kind of expose the changes. Right. Right. So, um, so basically like, so you mean like if you don't well go back this. and experience well it's this if I don't ever go back and experience what karate is today and mm-hmm. my body is old mm-hmm. I'll never have that thought or memory of me being crappy I just have my glory days mm-hmm. and it, and some of those that's more important to them mm-hmm. some people that's just more important to to enjoy those days for what they were mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that but you know. So if you haven't listened to, I don't even know, it's probably in the 20s, our episode, uh, I think it's titled Old School. It's our it's our um, interview with Sam Jaquenta, oh, yeah. who is a long, long time friend of ours. I've yeah. known him for 20 years. Um, he is uh, in his 80s, and yeah. he still trains. And right now he's going through some stuff, and he's training over Zoom, of all things, <laughs> with us uh, every other week. But... Um, his karate looks different than it used to look whenever he was younger. And we've had this conversation with him many times, like, Sam, it's okay, you know, for your karate to look different. Like, as younger people whose karate is maybe a little bit more athletic because we just have the ability, we're not judging you as someone who, you know, has done this yeah. for a long time. But granted, he's not somebody who's stepped away necessarily, so that does help, right. you know, but he has just gradually changed his karate over time to, to suit his body and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but we have asked guys, you know, like, hey, if you want to come back, you're more than welcome to, and it's okay to adapt your karate, yeah. you know, to, to where your body is. Yeah. Um, in some ways, I can respect them not wanting to. Yeah. I can, you know. Yeah. I mean, if their memories of, of karate and their glory days had a lot of pain associated with it, mm-hmm. I, I understand they wouldn't want to put themselves through that when they're 60, 70 years old. So the guy that I was, the, the situation I was referring to at the beginning of the podcast, we had a guy that came back um, one time a few years ago, and he was my idol when I was a kid, and um, he's very athletic, and came back and trained in one of our classes, and it's interesting because I've gotten so used to what we're striving toward as far as karate now, that I watched him train, and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't remember it looking like that but my perspective is different but also he had taken a number of years off but I think he was trying so hard to train the same way that he used to train um and his body was obviously in a different place um and man I know that he was like I think it tore him up a little bit that number one he didn't remember everything number two he couldn't physically do everything with the same amount of power and speed and finesse and all that kind of stuff um and I think it kind of nipped at his ego a little bit. And we all have one, so whatever. But um, we were trying to encourage him, like, hey, dude, it's okay. Like, you can come back and, you know, whatever. But um, he didn't. So um, yeah. what what would you say are, like, some very specific things? Like, if we have someone, which has happened many times, we have people come back to training who used to do Shotokan elsewhere, and they start training with us maybe 10, 15 years, 20 years after the fact. What are some specific things that we usually introduce that maybe are is different than the way they used to train? I can think well, of a few things. Well, Let me get started. Spot. I would say okay. um, what I've experienced so far is we do a lot more application. Okay. And the way we do application is different. 
Right. So um, that would be the number one. And then the secondly would be our approach is like, you just don't show up in training anymore. You kind of got to know your body. You got to know your limitations and respect what's going on. Because if you're injured, you don't want to come back anyways. Right. So very specifically, like looking at structural alignment, right. we'll typically like a lot of the stances that a lot of us used to do were maybe a little bit more, square more yeah, out. more square and, and a big strain on the knees and the hips yeah. versus what we're doing now is a lot more like, um, the, the ankle and the knee and the hip are in line either, you know, in a straight line or maybe in a pyramid shape, but that, that line is not being bowed, you know, so you're not, right. you're not straining the joints in a direction the joints yeah. are not supposed not to go. To create outward torsion. Right. And inward tension excessively. Right. right. In such a way that you ruin your structure. Right. And then we're also, you know, you, you're held accountable for things like the path of the arm and the elbow and the hand and the, and the shoulder and like all of that kind of stuff. And even the, the final position, you know, making sure that you're not over, over torquing any of those things. Yeah. You know, in, in Kokutsudachi and back stance, people tend to over rotate to have this very like open position with their hips and they're actually putting a lot of strain okay. on that front hip. Um, whenever they do that. So usually we're looking at the structure and we're like giving them some wiggle room Mm -hmm. and some relief. Um, and we have seen for the most part, people tend to, they're confused a little bit, but it does seem to go. I think they, they tend to be able to last a little bit longer without injury. Yeah. 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 So I mean, injury is going to happen no matter what. Yeah. It's a thing, right? So you just have to know how long before you go through those issues. Hopefully it doesn't happen. Hopefully it doesn't, but... Right. Yeah. We would lie if we said you come back and you're, you're injury-free. That's right. a lie. <laughs> right. I mean, no, that's, that's we, not we likely. consistently train the majority of our lives and we still get injured. After Jeremiah just told us that he took 15 years off. I mean, yes, we've consistently trained. <laughs> you mean, like, number-wise or consecutively? What's up? I said, you mean number wise or consecutively? This means if it's a majority of your life, it's a majority of your life. Doesn't matter if it's consecutive. Or well, not. I mean, as far it's as not I, a prison, it's not a prison sentence. Well, maybe. I just mean as far as like ad- adaptations. So sometimes like your physical adaptations can make a big difference as far as your injury. So if you are consistently training, then and you're even if it's not a lot, that's where you'll often see that you won't get injured as as readily versus you jumping back into something. That's when you if you're see doing the movements issue. correctly. Yes, that's true. If you're true. consistently training the wrong way, you're still going to be injured. Right. Yes. Well, there's that too. Um, so, I think the the hardest thing for most people, I think, is the psychology of it. It's like this is different, or this is not this. This is in some way different than it was when I last trained. So, what would you say to speak to that, like as an as a word of encouragement, if we have someone watching? who is considering going back into the dojo and they found a place that works for them, whatever, what would be maybe a word of encouragement to that person? I don't know if it's encouraging, but I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with them. I say you need to leave your ego at the house. Okay. Just, just walk in. Don't expect anything of yourself. Don't expect amazing things. Just go out and do it. Right. Right. Um, and don't, don't overdo it. Don't mm-hmm. be like, I got to punch harder. Oh, I feel great. I got to punch harder. Mm-hmm. And like I said the other, the other day, I was like, that side snap kick felt great. So I went harder and faster until I felt something not feel great. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that's ego to me. That's not like, that's not, everybody, we said it before, everybody has ego. You just kind of put your ego in check. Be like, hey, you know. Yeah. Um, if you could do that, you're, you're well on your way. I think what's crazy is like martial arts all martial arts has this unique ability to teach you humility. Right. Like, it, it, you know you're, you're not invincible, right? Mm-hmm. So why do we ever go, why do we go to the dojo with the idea that we are? Right. You know, it's like, it's crazy to me, so. I I would encourage them just to, you know, check your ego. Yeah. So. And, and just accept that this is just different. It may not be. A yeah. right or wrong it's thing. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. Now, you can make that judgment call down the road. But when you first encounter, you know, yeah. whenever you first encounter something new, a new dojo or a new teacher or a new style, maybe, maybe just try to look at it like this is different. Let me try this different thing. 
rather than looking at it as right and wrong. Yeah. I think that would be probably mo- most helpful to your it, point of view. If you just show up to training, you don't care to improve or not, you're going to train the way you used to train and all that, um, it's your free choice. Right? Mm-hmm. Just don't be disrespectful when you do it. Right. So, <sighs> yeah, we're both tired. It's been a long day. We've been We've been at it all day. Big yawn. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Lauren, you, you stepped away or had it stop training for, while well, you were pregnant for a little bit. You didn't train as much. You were on the floor, but you didn't get to train like you were beforehand. Mm. Have you ran into any kind of roadblocks or issues that kind of keep you from like training more as you feel better? Like now? Yeah. Like now. Um, well, I mean... I didn't. I haven't stepped away completely at any given time, except for right after delivery. And I know that we talked about this in the in the trans or pregnancy episode. But um, I think I'm not really at that like completely back point yet because I'm still like I'm I'm able to train basically like once a week, um, and we're kind of taking turns with the baby and like trying to um, make it to where I can. Yeah, so still train and stuff. So basically half a class a week. <laughs> basically, basically half of a class, yes. Half a class. So a about week. thirty minutes a week. Compared uh, to before pregnancy, you were doing easily. I was able to be more physically involved in yeah. teaching, so being able to demonstrate a whole lot more, and then um, able to usually train. I try try to train another class a week, um, ideally more than that. But so so about two classes a week. But um, what what, were you, what was your question? Was, is it? Do you feel like there's any roadblocks because of the, the way your training has changed from the pregnancy till now? I mean, it's obvious beforehand mm-hmm. the amount of the volume you were putting in compared mm-hmm. to now is completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, are you seeing yourself catching yourself going, man? I wish I this come back quicker, or man, my kick. You know, you know what I mean. Like, um, are you getting on? To, um, are you being critical to yourself because? The things you can't do yet. So only the frequency, I think, is the thing that I get that I'm hard on myself on. One thing I do notice is that, um, especially with continuing to think about karate and, and still being somewhat like active, but not to the same degree. Sometimes taking a break, in my case, has been a good thing mm. because I come back and and things make a little bit more sense. Um, I don't think I am muscularly quite as coordinated and I do feel a little bit of weakness. I don't think that's necessarily a roadblock. Um, but I look at it a little bit differently because I, because I, um, you know, what my karate's changed a lot through the years and, and to see, um, at least being for me, being able to see clearly, um, something that I'm struggling with, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Cause it's, it's just something to work on. Like it doesn't, it, to me, for for me, it's not a huge, like, detriment as far as, like, I'm never going to be able to do this or I have a really not bad attitude about it. Now, the only thing that I really get down on is whenever I get injured um, because it that's really tough because I'm trying to be very, very careful not to get injured. And right now with, with just where I am hormonally, like, you, you're, you, you can be more prone to injury whenever you are... Um, you know, postpartum because everything's a little bit different. You have more stretchiness in your ligaments and tendons and stuff. So, um, and I have a little, have, I've had a couple of aches and pains. Um, so that can be frustrating. So I guess maybe a lot, kind of along the same lines, like the injury, the injury thing, but they're not really karate related necessarily. Injuries are injuries, right? So, yeah. So, so that, that has been a frustrating thing, but overall I haven't really reached that point. I think it's just because I'm not back to the same amount of training. It's just been, more the frustration of wanting to train a little bit more. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So, I'm sure in time, we'll see. Yeah. So, what you working on? Um, right now... So, I feel like my karate's changed, but it's not second nature yet. Mm-hmm. Like, certain things I, I feel pretty good about, they're just not second nature or in habit yet. So, mm-hmm. last... Last, last two weeks I've been focusing again on volume um, and just, you know, Gonkaku, Nijishio, and then the Ubel stuff, right? Um, that's that's what we what I've been focusing on. Mm. Um, Gonkaku, the being balanced in the Manjukis mm-hmm. 
and and the posture is has been getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, I can do like two or three reps of you know the the one legged thing, um, and then I just go to crap. Mm. You know my leg gets my leg. I don't feel weak in my leg, but the balance, it it goes like my balance goes away. So I feel like I just need to be. A little, I'm almost there to strength, strong enough to kind of you know control it, but not yet. Mm, okay. Um, so that's what I've been working on. What you been working on? So, still working on that five punch. Five step, one punch. Five five punch, one step drill. Mm. But um, the last couple times I've filmed it, the eye opening thing is just how bad my elbows swing out to the side just like a noodle or something um that's not new it's not because of pregnancy it's just because i'm a weirdo so um (laughs) um one of the corrections i was given was rather than thinking about my fist going to the target thinking about my elbow driving to the target so that way that the the I guess the energy doesn't come up into my shoulders. And so I don't start like swinging the arms out to the side to try to get my hand there. Um, instead thinking more about kind of packing in the latch just a little bit, but then also driving the elbow toward the target. So that is the specific correction that I'm working on. So it's just one little thing yeah. at a time. So what I found with that five punch one step, mm-hmm. um, is like, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it helped me more when I was able to segment like body position in each punch. Mm. So like the first, the jab, like Yodayashi open hip, mm. the reverse punch, close body, you know, the, uh, the Chokazuki with the, the leg being in the good position to drive the open hip for the jab and the reverse punch, mm. trying to segment it to where I hit those points mm-hmm. in proper position is really helps me out. And then. I slowly just, I go from that to like, all right, make it all smooth. Just mm. smooth it out, smooth it out. And that's a slow process, but it's helped. Yeah. So maybe that's something you could think of. Well, I've been doing that with like the hip positioning because that was the correction I got too, is that the hips are not supposed to be square on all that, that yeah. they're supposed to actually rotate, which does help. But then um, I'm just, every, all, all of the end is just kind of squished together and it's like too yeah, late. Yeah, 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 so yeah. I have to kind of pull some of that back a little bit earlier in that yeah. step. But right now, if I can get the, if I can get the elbows under control, it'll make the punches faster because the fastest path from point A to point B <laughs> is a straight line, not a curved one, you know, I, you know? I wonder if it's smarter to go faster with the punch or slower with the step. Uh, I don't think slower with the step's a good idea because you end up floating that foot as you're stepping in. Not if you have good potty posture. Well, you good... guess who this... doesn't? So this here's the guy. cool <laughs> here's the cool thing about that, that combo to me is... It teaches you such good control of your body, mm-hmm. like how to hold, like be in position to move. I mean, it is really cool. Like yeah. that's that's a, a significant inch um, improvement. Um, it's got layers of oh, concepts dude, layers there. Of like everything. it's very very it's difficult. Very, it's it's difficult when you care about where you land, like how you land that last punch. So if we're both sandons and that's a sandon level. Key, um, Kihon thing, does that mean that we shouldn't be? Or that we suck? No, I I, th- I think even in, in Don levels <laughs> when you get kidding. tested, there's still progression. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's like when Greenbelt gets tested on a spinning back kick, are we looking for the perfect standing back kick? Are we looking for the proper... We're just looking for them to not have a heart attack when we ask them to do it. Is we're basically... just looking that they don't fall on their face. And if they do fall on their face, we have it on tape. I don't actually record the tests, so. No, you don't. We should. Parents do. Okay. We can always get them to sell out to kids. All right. Well, this is fun. That was a weird side conversation. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. I guess someone's tired now. I am. I am too. The cat's asleep. Yeah. So is the kid. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.